that, if we could turn to Revelation chapter 5. Continue our journey through this amazing book. As you're getting there, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for a wonderful time before your throne in worship, Lord, that we can simply praise you and thank you and glorify you for the great things that you have done, for who you are. And Lord, now as we've been edified and Lord, it just feels good after being in that place, in that time of worship, Lord. Now we want to dive deeply into your word and Lord, have that word minister to our spirits. Help us to learn what it is, the, the way you would like us to conduct our lives. And, and Lord, as we get into this part of your scripture, Lord, as we learn more about the things are to, that are to come, Lord, I just pray that you would Cause this to change our whole perspective on our lives and what they're all about. So, Lord, teach us, prompt us with your Holy Spirit this morning. We pray these things in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 1, Revelation chapter 5. John is describing what he is seeing now. He says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll, written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Just last week we went through chapter 4, and we got to read about John being on the island of Patmos. He was taken up in chapter 4 through the open door into heaven. And we got to see what he witnessed there in chapter 4. We saw the appearance of the throne and the one that was seated on the throne. And what John describes as the the color and the rainbow that were all around the throne and the thunder and the lightning and and before the throne was the the sea of glass like crystal perfectly reflecting the glory of the Lord. We saw the seven burning torches representing the Holy Spirit and then these four amazing creatures, these cherubim all around the throne never ceasing to proclaim the holiness of the Lord God Almighty giving glory and honor and thanksgiving. That was the picture that John set for us last week. It's amazing. And finally, at the end of that chapter, the 24 elders that represent the church, every time the cherubim would worship the Lord, John sees them falling down before them. And what did he see them doing? As they fell down to worship him, they took their crowns, the golden crowns that were off their heads, and they cast them before the throne. They said, Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And now John turns his attention in chapter 5. He turns his attention more closely at the one seated on the throne. And he sees in his right hand, what does he see? He sees a scroll. Now scrolls in that day... Unlike what we might like see in movies from the revolutionary time frame, the scrolls in that day were read horizontally, not vertically. The rolls of the scroll were on the left and the right, and the writing lay in narrow columns about three inches wide. And the scroll was held in the left hand and unrolled with the right. And as the reading went on, the previously read portion would be re-rolled. So you'd kind of be re-rolling it as you went. And on such a typical scroll, this book of Revelation that we have in front of us, it would fill a scroll 15 feet long, all rolled up. And this scroll that John sees is unopened. But John can see on the exterior of the scroll that there's writing on it. Very unusual. Because generally, on scrolls, there was only writing on the inside. There was only writing on one side of the scroll because as you were unrolling, you could read it. And if there was writing on the other side, it'd be kind of awkward having to read both sides of the scroll. But on this one, there's so much in the scroll that there's writing both on the inside and on the outside. And the scroll hasn't been opened. The only way you can see that is because you can see the writing on the exterior of the scroll. He also notices that the scroll was sealed. 
Normally, like legal documents or correspondence, one would tie a string around the scroll to hold it tight, right? You tie it in a knot, and then you drip some wax on that knot, and then you would press into that wax, either through a signet ring or some other object that had engraving on it, you would affix your seal into that wax right on that knot. It would make some type of unique impression in that wax. And it would provide assurance that the document was unaltered upon receipt. It was only read by those for whom it was intended to be read. Remember, the seal that was placed on the tomb where Jesus lay, they put wax up in the, in the crack between the two, the rock and the, and the cave itself. And they wanted it sealed such that they could tell whether if anyone entered into that tomb. To open that tomb or to break open this scroll, you had to break the seal. And the seals on the scroll made it like a registered letter, only to be delivered to and opened by a specific person. Or like a will, only to be read upon the death of the originator and only by people who were authorized to read it. And this particular scroll just didn't have one seal. It just didn't have one string wrapped around it with a knot and wax on it. It had seven. Seven seals. Again, this number pops up representing perfection and completeness. And each of these seals, we will see as we go forward in the next few chapters, each of these seals has special significance. Verse 2, John says, And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break these seals? Who's worthy? The Greek word worthy has its roots in weighing something on a scale. The root of the word worthy is is like you take a balance. You've seen those balance scales and you put a standard weight on one side and then you weigh something on the other to see if it actually measures that particular weight. And the question the angel is asking is, we have this scroll here on this one side of the balance scale. And who here is worthy? Who is worthy on the Lord's scales with the Lord's standard on this side, who in all of creation we put on this other side that will be found to meet God's standard? He asks that question. Who is worthy to open the scroll? And what is on the scroll is really unknown. Lots of speculation. But the scroll itself is just symbolic. The bottom line is the content of the scroll is not important. What is important are the seals and the one who is deemed worthy to open those seals. That's the critical thing. In verse 3, John makes an observation here. He says, no one, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. So this powerful angel shouts this loaded question. Who's worthy? Who is worthy? Figuratively saying, who in all of creation, whether in heaven or on the earth or under the earth, can step on this scale of worthiness? before the Lord to be found worthy to open the scroll or to even look into it. What is held back by these seven seals is some heavy stuff. Who is worthy or who is able to break the seals and read what's on this scroll? And who stepped forward? Nobody. Nobody stepped forward. No one's found worthy. And John is witnessing this. It's a very dramatic and emotional moment for John. He's affected by what's going on here for some reason. He understands that this scroll has some importance. It's being held in the right hand of the one who's sitting on the throne. This is a pretty important document. And no one is able to open it. And there seems to be a real need for this scroll to be open and read. There seems to be a need for this scroll to be opened up. And for the contents to be read, these seals to be broken, and and nothing's happening, and it's affecting John, and John actually seems to be crushed by this. The sheer magnitude of what is going on here 
crushes him. He says that he began to weep loudly. He was sobbing and mourning over the fact that no one was found worthy. I think John was just overwhelmed with shame over this. It absolutely grieved him that not even one could be found worthy. I talked last week about the responses of all who come into the presence of God to go through Scripture. People come into the presence of God. What is their response? What's their reaction when that happens? They're undone. They fall to the ground. They, they become sick for days. Angels had to get tongs and, and press them up against your lips because you had un, unclean lips. Isaiah 6, chap, chapter 6, verse 5, he said, Woe is me, for I'm lost. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah is undone. And an angel has to go over there with a burning coal and touch it to his lips to remove the guilt from the things that he's spoken. We see guys like Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Paul and even John now. And their responses when they're in the presence of God. And now this question Forget about being in the presence of God. question now is, well, who's worthy to open this scroll? All of these people that we've read about, they can't even be in His presence. Forget about opening the scroll. And John, we know John, and the life of John, and he knew the Lord, he knew all about the grace of Jesus Christ. He understood the grace brought about by the shed blood of his Savior probably more tangibly than any of us ever will. He had lived it. He had seen it. But when he was in the presence of the Lord and saw the real impact of the fall, he witnessed the effect that sin had had on creation, how God now held this standard up in front of his eyes and had this angel ask a very simple question. Who is worthy? And it caused him to sob and to wail that none of us were found worthy. And the reality had a profound effect on him, and it should on us as well. We should never take the grace of God for granted. We should never, ever diminish or fail to recognize the magnitude of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. Verse 5. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So who goes to comfort John? One of the elders. It's kind of wild that one of the elders would go to comfort John the elder. And what does this elder tell John? He tells him, don't cry, man. There's someone who is worthy to open the scroll. It's going to be okay. And who is it who is worthy? Who does he say that is worthy? It's the Lion of Judah. Where does that phrase come from? We turn to Genesis chapter 49. All the way back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 49, this is just before Jacob's death. He gathers his sons together. And gave them all a blessing and a prophecy. What would happen to them and their descendants? And in verse 8, Jacob turns to his son Judah. He says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? And in verse 10 it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him. Now that Hebrew word in the English Standard Version translates tribute. In many other versions it's Shiloh, or in Hebrew pronounced Shiloh. What we say as Shiloh today, the, the Hebrew word is of uncertain derivation, but has been translated through the century as he whose right it is. That's what Shiloh means. 
He who has the right. He's, he whose it is. The Israelites understood this as a messianic prophecy. When they say the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, they understood this as a messianic prophecy. The scepter, the line of kings, shall not depart from the tribe of Judah, beginning with David, until Shiloh comes. Until the one whose right it is comes. The line of David would rule conditionally. God put some conditions on this. As long as you continue to follow my commandments, the scepter shall not depart from the line of David. And if we fast forward from this time to the time of the first century, under the time of Roman occupation, what had happened? The line of David had been broken, hadn't it? During the time of the Herods and as Jesus came on the scene, the rabbis considered this particular prophecy a disaster of unfulfilled Scripture. The line of David had been broken. The Davidic line of rule had been broken back in 586 B.C. with the capture of Zedekiah by Babylonians. And no Messiah had come due to the rebellion of Israel. And the rabbis of Jesus' day saw this as a great tra tragedy and cause for mourning. But there is no cause for mourning. That's what they're trying to tell John here. There's no cause for mourning, for Shiloh had come at the perfect time. Now turn back to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. We will learn about these words where it says, the root of David. So in Genesis 49, we, we learn about the phrase, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now let's, let's focus on the root of David and where that comes from. Gen Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. It says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesse being David's father. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. I'll skip to verse 10. In that day, Isaiah proclaims, in that day the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. I'll turn to Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23 echoes very similar words as Isaiah does. Jeremiah 23, verse 5. He proclaims, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Verse 6. In his days, Judah will be saved. And Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. So the elder goes to John with all this as the context and tells him, John, there's no cause for weeping. There's no cause for mourning here. It's a time for rejoicing, actually. The lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of Jesse, David's father, has conquered has been victorious. The righteous branch has been victorious so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. There's no reason. There was reason for John to weep because we just made a mess out of things. That's why John was weeping. There was no one found worthy. But God. But God had brought beauty from ashes, hadn't He? The line of kings from the descendants of David had been cut off at the root by the Lord because of their disobedience and idolatry. But out of that root, at the proper time to fulfill the prophecy given by Daniel, he caused a shoot to spring forth from the root of David. And as a result of the providence of God, there indeed was someone who was weighed on the scales and found worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. 
God had provided a Redeemer. And now if we go back to Revelation 5, verse 6. John hears all this. He hears these words from the elder. Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So John, he's like, all right. The Lion's here. He looks for the lion. He goes, he's looking around on the scene. He looks for the conquering hero. But what does he see? In verse 6, he looks for the lion. And it says, In between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb. As though it had been slain with seven horns, with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So between the throne and the four cherubim and the 24 elders arrayed all around them, in the middle of this is a lamb standing. And John looked over to see the lion of Judah. And instead he sees a lamb. In order for Jesus to fulfill his role as the lion of Judah, he had to become the perfect sacrificial lamb of God. Jesus is both the lion and the lamb. He is, his power was perfected in meekness. And John sees the lamb standing there between the throne and the elders and the cherubim as though it had been slain, still bearing the wounds of a lamb that had been sacrificed. A living sacrifice. It's standing there. Standing in the midst of that assembly as a mediator. And so John is shown the symbol of Christ as the atoning sacrifice of our sins. And the symbolism continues with this lamb having seven horns, which reflects God's omnipotence. He bore the marks of sacrifice, but he's all powerful. The horns are a symbol of power and strength. And he had seven eyes, which reflect his omniscience. He is all-knowing. And John notes that the seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Verse 7. John is observing now. And he observes the Lamb. And he said, He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. No created being was found worthy to take the scroll, but the Lamb can take it. And so the scroll passes from the hands of the Father to the hands of the Son. And there is some significance here. There's, there's some symbolism here. Verse 8, When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. This is a huge moment here. When the Lamb takes the scroll, the weeping ends and the praising begins. We found someone to be worthy. But more importantly, the same worshipful adoration that was given to the Father sitting on the throne is now given to the Son. And the elders and the cherubim fall down before the Lamb. And they can only fall down before the Lamb if He is truly God. None of God's created beings are worthy of worship. Only God is worthy of the response seen here. We do not worship a babe and a manager or a corpse on a cross. We worship the living, reigning Lamb of God who is in the midst of all in heaven. That's who we worship. We worship a living Lord. Each of the 24 elders is holding a harp. The elders are ready to jam. They're prepared to worship the Lamb of God and they have golden bowls of incense. The smoke that goes up from these golden bowls represent the prayers of the saints. We said last week that the 24 elders represent the church as a whole. And here we see the church's worship and prayer represented here. When we gather here to worship the Lord and when we pray and 
whether we're here together or in private in our closets, this worship and these prayers go up to the very throne of God. Psalm 141 verse 2 says, Let my prayer be counted as incense before you, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. There's huge significance to the worship and prayers that we offer to God. There's huge significance to that. We should offer them as a fragrant aroma that is going up, up into the very throne of God. Offered in praise and thanksgiving and as worship to the Lamb of God who was slain for us. So when we pray and when we worship, we should do it with an understanding of who our audience is, right? We see what's going on here where the elders have these bowls of incense which are the prayers of the saints. When we pray and we worship, we should do it with an understanding of who our audience is. We should do it in the context of what we just read here. Understanding John's response to there being no one found worthy to open the scroll and the seals. We're wretched, pitiable creatures when we come into his presence, aren't we? In our own flesh. But God, but God provided a lamb worthy to be slain such that we can offer worship and praise and prayers that are holy and acceptable in his sight. These prayers go up with a pleasing aroma like the incense that was burned by the priests as an offering in the sanctuary. Think about that as you pray and as you worship, that they're going before the Lord like incense. And this worshipful attitude is captured next in verse 9, Revelation chapter 5. Verse 9 says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language, and for people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. John records here that they sang a new song. This echoes Psalm 96.1 where it says, O sing to the Lord a new song. There was something new going on here. And the significance is captured in a new song. And they're singing this song to Jesus. When we worship, we are singing to the Lord. And they said, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why was he worthy? Because he was God. And he allowed himself to be slain and by his blood he ransomed. The Greek word there is, really means purchased. He purchased a people for God from every tribe and every nation. Not just the Jews, but all of mankind. And who does it say they were purchased for? God. There was a transaction that took place on the cross. There was a transaction that took place there on that hill called Golgotha. And that transaction, that purchase, involved the redemption of people from every nation and language and tribe on the earth. And the price for those people was the death of the one that had created them. Let me repeat that. The price for those people was the death of the one that created them. He died to save the very people that were slaying him. And he died to save the very people that sin against him. So would you say that makes him worthy? Yeah, I think that covers it. And I love the fact that it says that he ransomed us. He ransomed, he purchased a people for God. We weren't just ransomed and that's the end of it. We were purchased by his blood for God, for a purpose. And what is that purpose? In verse 10 it says, And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. We have been made a kingdom. What's a kingdom? A kingdom isn't about land. A kingdom is about people. 
And it says, we have been made priests, every one of us. Turn to Luke chapter 17, if you will. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God in this passage. Luke 17, verse 20 to 21. Always being questioned by the Pharisees. In verse 20, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. Jesus answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. We could say the same thing to the world today, right? When is the kingdom of God coming? The kingdom of God is, in a way, in a partial way, already come. We are the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. We are the kingdom of God. He is the king, and we are the kingdom. And not only are we the kingdom, but we are priests. Exodus 19.6, the first part of verse 6 says, And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Speaking to the nation of Israel. And in 1 Peter 2.9, Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. We have been grafted in. that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness and into His light. Again, called with a purpose. You're a chosen race. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. A people for His own possession. You're His kingdom. Why? That you may proclaim. That you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness, out of all that stuff what John is weeping about, and into his marvelous light. And John kind of symbolizes this in heaven as John is weeping, and we see that the Lamb is worthy to take that scroll, and John could witness this whole process of how there was darkness before that, there was mourning before that, there was no one found worthy, but who's worthy? The Lamb is worthy to take the scroll. And our lives represent that as well. As we have been called out of darkness and now we are in His marvelous light. We are a kingdom. We are priests in that kingdom. We no longer need a priest to be mediator for us. God provided Himself as a mediator through Jesus. He ransomed, ransomed us out of the need for a priestly mediator. So now we are the priests. We can freely represent God to those who do not know Him. We have that right to represent God to those who do not know Him. And we can go to God to confess our sins directly and fellowship with Him now. We, don't, we can go up to the mountain ourselves. We don't need a Moses-like figure and then only see God's glory from the radiance that was left on His face after being in His presence. We can obtain that radiance for ourselves and bring that radiance out into the world out there such that they can see what God is doing in us and through us. And what is even cooler is that we continue to hear through this revelation given to John that we will reign with him somehow. I don't even know how that works. I just know that he tells us that we will reign with him. And so understanding all of that, what does that tell you about the worth of the ransom that was paid? What was the worth, what was the value of that ransom that was paid? He purchased us for Himself such that we can go from being woefully lost, pitiable creatures to priests who will reign alongside the Creator of the entire universe. Think about that. Think about the value of that ransom that was paid, such that it can transform us from woeful, pitiable creatures who are lost to priests in his kingdom, those who will reign with him forever. That's an amazing deal. That's an amazing God. Back to verse 11 in Revelation 5. John is still looking. He's taking all this in. He's blowing them away. 
He says, then I looked and I heard around the throne a party's about ready to break out. And the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now, understanding the magnitude of what the Lord has done for us. Understanding that magnitude. What is the response of those who witnessed the Lamb demonstrating being redeemed, being deemed worthy by taking hold of the scroll of the seven seals? What is the response of those who are in this environment as the Lamb takes hold of the scroll and what that represented Understanding the magnitude of everything we just talked about. What's the response? John looks and he hears all around the throne the cherubim, the elderly, the elderly, the elders, <laughs> and literally myriad. The Greek word is myriad, it means ten thousands and ten thousands. The cherubim and the elders, and literally ten thousands of ten thousands and thousands of thousands, is a lot of people. There's a lot of, lot of worship going on. That's right. And they're all saying with a loud voice, they're all singing in unison. What? Worthy is the Lamb. Right? The significance of what just occurred. This passing of this scroll from the Father to the Son that someone was found worthy blows heaven away. That's what John got to witness. That's what we can read here. It just gives you goosebumps. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Absolutely. The lamb is worthy. And he's worthy to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. For he alone is worthy. In verse 13, the worship continues. It's not just breaking out in heaven. It's breaking out everywhere. It says, I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four, the four living creatures, there's not much left to say after that. What do they say? Amen. And the elders fell down and worship. Now, I don't know if I can do any of this worship that's going on any justice with my words. But I'd like to close simply today, as I read through this passage, it reminded me of music from a guy named George Frederick Handel and the text from his friend Charles, Charles Jennings. And I think they capture just a glimpse of what is going on here in these verses as they use this passage as the inspiration for what leads up to the closing of the unparalleled oratorio, Messiah. There's a passage, there's a section of the Messiah called, Worthy is the Lamb. And I want to play this video for us now because it takes this text right from this passage. And I think it just gives us a little glimpse into what this worship is going to be like. So worship the Lord as we close with this and give glory to God.
because we enter into your throne room with all of your heavenly hosts, the angels and the cherubim, the elders, and Lord, we are just undone by the fact that you have saved us, you have redeemed us. You alone are worthy. And so, Lord, we just give you praise this morning. You have taken a people and you've redeemed them. You've purchased them with the blood of your Son. And Lord, my prayer today is as we reflect back on this, on this text that we've read this morning, this amazing vision that John, you allowed your servant John to see, it still comes alive as we read it. It still gets captured in music as you inspire men through the centuries. This particular vision is just such a glorious vision. I pray that it would change us. But the fact that we have been called out of darkness and into your miraculous light, the fact that you alone are worthy, that you have purchased us for God, that we are priests in your kingdom, and we no longer need a mediator, that we can go up to the mountain ourselves and dwell in your presence. And then go back down off that mountain, Lord. And that radiance that we have taken in, still glowing in our faces as we go out through those doors today, after having been in your presence, my prayer is that radiance would be noticed. That our lives would continue to be changed and transformed through the working of your Holy Spirit. That people would see our lives and declare, worthy is the lamb that was slain. We pray these things in the matchless and holy name of Jesus. Amen.